Um, dear all, it is my pleasure to represent the IPRES 2020 uh, Program Committee and lead you towards the final session and keynote of Stephen Gonzalez Monserrate. My name is Marcel Ras, uh, and I'm the coordinator of the research data support team at the Vrije Universiteit uh, of Amsterdam, which is the other Amsterdam University. As been mentioned before, I think in the opening session, um, Glasgow means literally dear green place. A place to consider the ethical and ecological, uh, ecological different, difficult word, context of our work. Not a surprise then that the uh, env environmental sustainability is one of the main themes of this conference. During the last couple of days, we have seen some very good contributions exploring the env environmental sustainability of digital preservation practice and our role and our work uh, has in the support of environmental well-being and sustainability. Even two of them uh, uh, got um, uh, Best Paper and Best Poster awards, uh, actually. Last year, the Dear Green Place was also the podium of the United Nations Climate Change uh, Conference, imposing further agreements impending the UN sustainability, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, the climate crisis and the climate justice, resulting in the Glasgow Climate Pact. I do hope that after this uh, year's co uh, IPRES conference, we will continue having fundamental conversations uh, on the environmental impact and of digital preservation. I guess there is no doubt that this is an urgent, uh, that this is very urgent and that uh, there is not a better arena uh, for this than the IPRES conference and the IPRES community. It doesn't have to result in another Glasgow Pact, but at least it should urge us. We will close the IPRES 2020 uh, conference with a keynote that certainly will feed this conversation and send us home with a lot of food for thought. Preserving our cultural heritage is extremely valuable, valuable for many reasons. We have heard that from our previous, previous uh, keynote speakers especially. But it also comes with a cost. Until recently, preservation of digital collections and research data was focusing on how to store, how to manage, check, share and access uh, this in the most perfect way. But the climate crisis and the huge costs of energy brought another player into the field. Of course, a player which, al which was already there, but he was a, bit, a little bit of a substitute player. The same counts for the research domain. For researchers and universities like mine, open science and open data are buzzwords. Opening up research data for future researchers uh, and research, making research more transparent. For the scientific environment in which data is findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable, that sounds great, but again, it has a price. Large-scale scientific research and the storage and interoperability of research data uses a lot of carbon-based energy and emits a very large amount of greenhouse gases. The first groundbreaking study, uh, at least one of the first groundbreaking studies on, en on the environmental impact of digital preservation was the article of Keith Pendergrass and others towards environmentally sustainable digital preservation. The authors explained that if we want to move towards environmental sustainable digital preservation, we need to critically examine the motivations and assumptions that shape the current practice. That eventually will result shifting the digital preservation professionals paradigm of appraisal, permanence and availability of digital content. To our keynote now, Stephen Gonzalez Monserrate is PhD candidate in the History, Anthropo Anthropology, Science, Technology and Society program at MIT. He's an ethnograph ethnographer of data centers and his dissertation serves in the, di in, in the diverse ecological impacts of computing and digital data storage in New England, Arizona, Puerto Rico and Iceland. Stephen has written many articles on this, top uh, on this topic and I would advise you to read them all. Stephen holds an M MA in ant Anthropology from Brandeis University and a BA in Feminist Anthropology from Keene State Col College. And he is always, uh, is also a fiction writer and filmmaker. Drawing from six years of uh, ethnographic fieldwork in data centers, this keynote explores the ways that data centers and other digital storage infrastructures contribute to climate change, 
uh, uh, desertification, noise pollution, and the pro proliferation of toxic e-waste. One of, one of the very interesting uh, um, things uh, Stephen will, will mention in his talk is, is the term of uh, the cloud as a carbonivore. A single data center can use the same amount of electricity as 50,000 homes. For those who were in the environment uh, uh, one session on Tuesday, that is more than two aberrith width. And two times the size of the poor Dutch city where a huge Facebook data center was planned to build. Amid forecasts of a tenfold increase in data storage cap uh, capacity in 2030, data storage industry professionals are, th are striving to bring about carbon neutral or climate neutral data centers design in practice. This keynote serves a range of data centers in the future, thinking with artists, fut futurists, fiction writers, and engineers to sketch what, what sustainable data storage might look like at the end of the decade and beyond. So it is my honor and my pleasure to give the floor to Stephen. Thank you, uh, Marcel, for that very kind introduction. And thank you all for being here in Glasgow. And for those of you who are online, um, congratulations, you made it to the end of the conference. <laughs> Uh, but first, I, I also want to convey my gratitude to William, Angela, and everybody else involved in planning uh, this conference and for the warm welcome that I have felt uh, as an outsider to this community. So thank you. This evening, we are going to talk about the cloud, its history, its culture, and its future. So I invite you to join me on a journey through time Together, we'll imagine tomorrow's and yesterday's quite distant from our present, but nonetheless instructive. As I have learned over the past few days here at IPRES, um, each of you is no stranger to time travel, because preservation is about reaching out beyond the present so that the generations of the future might remember those who preceded them. And in that spirit, I welcome you aboard my time machine. Uh, our first stop is the year 1000 CE. Clouds flock along the ridges of the Andes Mountains. They shed their dew to feed plots of maize, quinoa, and potatoes that flourish along terraced slopes. A runner emerges from the mist, bearing something ropey in their hands. An array of strings that droop like fingers. Some are knotted, others are colored with dye. But to your trained eyes, these subtle variations are rich and dense with meaning. You count the knots in the string, excavating the code hidden in this computer spun from fabric. In geometries of fiber, you read ledgers and legends, myths and maps, censuses and chronicles. For this is the quipu, the informatic backbone of Andean civilization, and you are its interpreter. For millennia, the civilizations of the Andes relied on the computational prowess of the quipu to administer an empire that spanned thousands of kilometers across one of the most extreme and rugged landscapes on Earth. But the quipu was only one cog in a well-oiled Andean information machine. Without the aid of cavalry or wheels to uh, traverse across the steep terrain of the Puna watershed, Andean empires thrived by creating a robust network infrastructure of human runners, roads, kipu, and their interpreters, the kipu kayamuk. Spooled together, this latticework of runners' bodies, roads, numbers, and fabrics formed what might be the world's first cloud. Woven from fabric rather than silicon, the informatic cloud of Tawantinsuyu sustained a civilization that at its apex encompassed a geographic area of over 4,000 kilometers. 
In 1583, the colonial officials on the Third Council of Lima decreed the quipu a blasphemy against their god. They banned their use and ordered all that they could find to be burned and destroyed. But despite the Spaniards' brutal attempt to erase pre-colonial Andean history, enough of the quipu cuna survived into the present to tell us the stories of the ancient Andeans who wove them. Today, the quipu remains an important aspect of ceremonial life for Andean peoples. The fact that so much of the Andean cloud has endured into the 21st century is as remarkable as it is instructive for us today. A quipu is made from woven, delicate plant or camelid fibers. Astonishingly, many are still durable enough to handle, to hold in your own hands today. Like other textile artifacts, they must be preserved in climate-controlled environments to prevent the growth of microorganisms or molds that might decay them. Even so, that computers made of fabric could survive for centuries is astonishing, <laughs> given that 21st century solid-state disk drives seldom last more than a decade. For all of our technological sophistication today, durability is not one of our strong suits. And the quipu is only one of myriad ancient data preservation technologies uh, far more durable than our silicon-based computers. On the opposite side of the earth, Shang Dynasty era healers etched writing into the bones of animals. They applied flame to divine answers from the random cracks and fissures that the heat carved into the bones. These ancient data storage devices, known as oracle bones, uh, date back to 1250 BCE. A collection of these artifacts sits just 75 kilometers east of us uh, at the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh. So check it out. <laughs> uh, even more ancient than the quipu and the oracle bones are the cuneiform tablets of the Sumerians etched in clay in Mesopotamia over 5,000 years ago, archaeologists can still read the tax records that they contain. These examples from the ancient world leave us with a very simple question. Why is our digital heritage so fragile? Some might say that the ephemerality of hard disks is an inevitability of design. Uh, an engineered trade-off for greater storage capacity at the expense of durability. But as an anthropologist, I believe the answer is less about design and more about practice, uh, a property of culture rather than some hard limit coded by nature. Because technologies always reflect back the priorities and values of the cultures that shape them. As a millennial born on the eve of the World Wide Web's launch, I have watched the internet evolve and mature into what it is today. I've, I've grown up with it. Uh, and, and it began as an erudite corner for hobbyists, but by the turn of the millennium, it became so integral, so crucial for everyday life, that it began to be framed as a human right, the right to connect. Much of the internet's evolution stemmed from its unanticipated uses and the cultures of expression that claimed it as their own. Grumpy cat memes, like the one shown here, are a prime example of this. Bloggers begot social media, Web, web 2.0 followed. Since then, the digital sphere has become a repository of the quotidian and the mundane. Status updates, likes, clicks, views, our digital footprints, our memories, our heritage. By the 2000s, no one could argue that the digital was not a part of history. But if the internet is a word we use to describe a technology, cloud is what we say to convey an idea. Cloud is an abstraction, like this collage of Adobe logos. It is a feeling of connectivity 
a fantasy of weightlessness, a dream of the seamless flow of information carried to us to our fingertips at the speed of light. What is the cloud? To answer this question, uh, we, need, we need a more cultural rather than a technical framework. From our homes, we upload and download information from the cloud as if it lives in the sky. But in actuality, the cloud resides in land and under the sea. It is, as this installation by the art collective Annex depicts, uh, so thoroughly entangled in our lives that we can scarcely see it for what it is. We can scarcely see where it begins and where it ends. The cloud is light, carried by tangles of undersea fiber optics that stitched continents and capitals together in a vast meshwork. It is cellular towers that broadcast signals to our network devices and smart appliances. But most crucially, it is bits and bytes anchored to servers that live in data centers. If the cloud were a living thing, they would be its heart. Data centers are where the digital lives. I've come to know data centers as a doctoral student at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Since 2015, I have studied data centers in Iceland, the New England, the southwestern United States, and Puerto Rico. I am interested in the stories that people who run the cloud have to tell about themselves and the worlds that they inhabit. My method is ethnography, which simply stated is an approach to learning based on observation and the deep cultivation of relationships with people. In data center circles, I have been known variously as the intern, the spy, uh, fly on the wall, uh, new guy, or that dogged nuisance who will stop at nothing to get an interview and will call back repeatedly if ignored. For my research, I have worked in data centers alongside technicians, attended professional conferences and trainings, conducted interviews, and spent time getting to know the communities where data centers are cited. These experiences give me a unique perspective on how the cloud operates and what the stakes of its environmental footprints are for us in the future. I'll start by telling you that every data center is unique. There are modular micro data centers that are, house a single rack of servers and shipping containers like these. But there are others that are quite gigantic, like the China Telecom Inner Mongolia Information Park, which spans one million square meters. Some are purpose built to house data, while others are sited in the ruins of old military bunkers, caves, or office buildings, archives, or the moldy basements of churches or universities. Data centers are found on every biome on Earth, from the frigid ice shelf of Antarctica to the hot and humid tropics of Singapore. Some are located near the Arctic Circle, where the planet's ambient cold temperatures act as a natural air conditioner for hot servers while others are clustered in the scorching desert of the American Southwest, where they guzzle scarce groundwater to keep cool. This, the industry also varies based on the business model or infrastructure configuration, uh, as, as many of you know. Some companies or entities host their own data, like archives, um, a configuration we call enterprise. Uh, typical reasons for this are that they lack the resources to outsource um, hosting to a cloud provider, or the information that their data centers keep are so sensitive um, to be, too sensitive to be held on private servers. Co-location providers are server farms, where space is leased out to companies who don't want to manage their own data. Cooling, security, those things are taken care of. Uh, and then at the, the, the top of the food chain, as it were, are the hyperscalers. Hyperscalers like Google, which enjoy the greatest redundancy and energy efficiency of, of any uh, other kind of data center, and where uh, their employees are very happy because they can cavort around on scooters like this. But I'll just 
tell you that most of my experiences are, are not that. It's the year 2020, the year a pandemic rattled governments and markets. Were it not for the cloud and the people who maintain it, we might have never recovered as a civilization from COVID-19. As a result, it is difficult, if not impossible, for us to imagine what might happen if the cloud ever vanishes. While such a scenario sounds like the premise of a science fiction novel, the two tales from the cloud I will share with you today might convince you otherwise. Our first stop is Boston, Massachusetts. Meet Tom. He's a ruddy-faced 50-something-year-old with Irish-American roots and a big personality. I spend my weekend following him around the halls of a 50,000-square-foot data center. We weave through a labyrinth of blinking server racks as he tidies up messy cables, as he decommissions old equipment, and his favorite task, hunting for vermin. Now, when I say vermin, you might think of rats or roaches or other critters known to wreak havoc on electronics, like the infamous squirrel that uh, profiled on data center knowledge that uh, downed uh, Yahoo's data center. But Tom's vermin <laughs> are of a far more elusive sort. Finding them requires a special set of skills. And no, they are not grown men in dinosaur costumes. I find Tom hunched over one of the servers, eyes closed, hands outstretched as if he's in some kind of state of uh, metaphysical prayer. Can you hear that? He tells me. I shake my head. I, the that that I hear is the same cacophony of servers, fans, the, the, the annoying background soundtrack of, of being inside of a, a data center. I don't hear anything particularly different or noteworthy about the sound, but he hears something. That rack is starved for airflow. Hear how shrill it is? They only get that way when they are very hungry. Hunger is not a word most people would use to describe the behavior of a server, but Tom always speaks in metaphor. Uh, his servers are named after planets from Star Wars. They have genders and personalities and temperaments. Hungry, I later realize, is Tom speak for overheating. The server lacks sufficient airflow to cool its hot innards, so its onboard fans rev up, desperate to draw in more air. Hence the shrill sound. Tom once referred to himself as Elmer Fudd, a hunter who always gets bested by a, a prey far more cunning. Only we aren't hunting rabbits. Our vermin, I soon learn, is something far less tangible. Heat, what the anthropologist Dame Mary Douglas calls matter out of place, or in this case, energy. Hotspots are a term data center technicians use to describe thermal anomalies. The heat of computation, if left unchecked, multiplies exponentially, leading to thermal outages like the one that downed Oracle's data center uh, in London this summer. To maintain uptime, or the constant availability of cloud services, heat must always be thwarted. Tom taught me how to hear heat. I had previously assumed cloud technicians were more reliant on sensors or more sophisticated gadgets or instruments to maintain their data centers. But through Tom, I realized much of the work of running the cloud, of running data centers, was more about embodied skill, gut feelings and instincts, servers with personalities, than it was about maths, were glitzy tools like computational fluid dynamics models. These models, uh, abbreviated as CFDs, predict the volumetric movement of air in a data center. They indicate where hotspots might occur um, and how they might be resolved by subtle shifts in airflow distribution. The models also suggest how to optimize cooling to conserve energy. But such optimizations are often met with skepticism, in my experience, or more often, fear. Fear 
that less cooling will result in more failures. Fear that sustainability and uptime do not run in the same cart. For Tom, the key to hunting hotspots like these is attuning your senses, teaching yourself to distinguish signal from noise, because the stakes are very high. Just one minute of downtime can cost a company tens of thousands of dollars. And for the employees, even a single instance of failure can be the difference between having a job and not. One evening over cold beers at a local pub, I asked Tom how he would feel if downtime struck his data center. Emasculating was not the word I expected to hear in response. But in retrospect, however, it, it makes a great deal of sense. Nearly all of the data center professionals I have interviewed, shadowed, or observed identify as men. Less than 10% of the workforce, uh, women remain significantly underrepresented in the data center industry. While Tom is very vociferous about the need for more women in the data center, others are less welcoming or even openly misogynistic. Take this remark from a woman and industry veteran, Carrie Goetz. One of my bosses kept a calendar on the wall, and any time a woman was in a bad mood, he would mark a red X on that date to predict cycles of behavior. This remark illuminates the everyday hostility towards women in these masculinized tech workspaces. If you can believe it, this remark is quite tame compared to some of the others I have accumulated over the years. Back at the bar, Tom and I toast to our successful hunt for the hotspot critter. After another round, Tom confesses to me that the burden of the cloud is taking a toll on his health. Hypertension, migraines. He tells me he sees a therapist regularly. He needs help managing his stress and bringing his data center home with him at night. My data center is killing me, he tells me. Some months later, at a conference in New York City, I interviewed Lynn, one of the few women data center managers I have had the privilege of meeting. Men are wasteful, she told me over coffee. They crank up the air conditioning because they are so fearful about downtime. They waste so much electricity because they don't want to be wrong. As an anthropologist, I'm trained to be very suspicious of sweeping generalizations like these. But I have found that this observation about a pervasive, cavalier attitude towards sustainability and waste rings largely true to my experiences in data centers. As Tom's and Lynn's stories reveal, the cloud's most inner sanctums are not insulated from cultural values. They are not run by automatons. Tom is the product and victim of a workplace culture that privileges an inhuman ideal of infallibility, 99.9% .9 uptime at whatever cost. He prefers his own bodily sense, senses over instruments and models because they are tried and true. A case study in heroic and perhaps toxic masculinity. Like the data center companies, Tom's priorities are uptime over minimizing waste. Inside the data center, waste is often difficult to see and feel beyond utility bills. Cloud workers seldom feel the consequence of the electricity, water, and e-waste emitted by their facilities. For those living around data centers in the communities where they are sited, this waste is less abstract, as our next stop will show. Chandler, Arizona, Chuparosa Park, Brenda waits for me by the basketball hoop. I wave to her, taking in the idyllic scene, uh, children playing tags, families grilling up hamburgers and hot dogs, teens curled up on manicured lawns with books, paved paths that wind through spindly Palo Verde trees. And yet, I feel very uneasy. There is an unseen menace that seems to haunt my awareness. I can't 
put a finger on what it is, but it's there. It's there even as I walk towards Brenda, who removes her earplugs when she spots me. As if, as if sensing my distress, she points to a cluster of industrial buildings abutting the park. And then, with startling clarity, I hear it. I understand. This is the sound of suburbia. No, it's... It's a hum, right? Uh, a constant droning like a jet, revving up for takeoff but never leaving the runway. It's the din of the digital, it, the sound of emails and cat videos and payroll and everything else riffling through the corridors of Cyrus One's co-location data center. I ask Brenda how the noise pollution impacts her life. Sometimes I want to rip my hair out and scream and claw at the walls. I want to burn that place to the ground. I want to run away from here, but I can't because this house will never sell, because no one will ever want to live with all that racket. Brenda was one of a dozen Chandler residents that spoke to me about the harmful effects of data center noise pollution on their lives. I highlight some of their remarks here. Dull ringing in my ears, like an acoustic attack. My head is throbbing all day. Constant nausea. Feels like being underwater. It's there in my sleep, in my dreams. I'm on the brink of insanity. For the residents of Chandler, the unceasing whir of air handlers and diesel generators required to power and cool the cloud are a constant disruptive presence in their lives. Unlike other industries, the cloud never sleeps. It is, runs 24-7, 365. Residents claim to experience symptoms of insomnia, anxiety, hypertension, and depression as a result of prolonged exposure to noise pollution as this word cloud uh, generated from my interviews suggests. Seeking justice, residents banded together to demand noise attenuation and ban the future construction of data centers in their community. Despite their best efforts and promises made by city officials over many years, little has changed since the construction of Cyrus One's facility in 2018. In fact, additional data centers have appeared in the greater Phoenix area, uh, and, and more have been approved for construction in Chandler, Mesa, and Phoenix. As my research shows, the cloud as we know it is already nearing its breaking point. With technicians like Tom, who rely on gut over scientific models that might reduce waste, it is not shocking to learn that the cloud contributes 3.7% of greenhouse gas emissions, the rough equivalent of the airline industry. An average data center like Tom's consumes as much electricity as a small city or 50,000 homes. The electrical grids that power most data centers in the United States are coal-fired. The cloud is a carbonivore. This is Virginia's data center alley, the world's largest cl cluster of data centers. Only 4% of the electricity it consumes comes from renewable energy sources like wind or solar. Dominion Energy, the electricity provider for the region, uh, pledges to increase that renewable energy production to a paltry 10% by 2030. Meanwhile, this same company is investing billions of dollars in fossil fuel projects like the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, which if, con if constructed would all but guarantee another decade of coal-fired cloud services. But carbon is not the cloud's only ecological sin. The Zuni, one of the many peoples indigenous to the American Southwest, 
tell the story about a monster that dwells in the mountains called Cloud Eater. Driven by an insatiable hunger, the creature devours all the clouds in the sky, desiccating crops, drying out rivers, and bringing the communities of the desert to the brink of extinction. To save humanity, the creator dispatches the hero twins, Ahayuta, to slay the cloud eater and restore moisture to a parched land. The cloud sweeping over the desert communities of the American Southwest is not so unlike the Zuni's cloud eater, for its thirst for water to cool its servers is staggering. Data sensors like Cyrus One's and Chandler guzzle an average of two million gallons of water a day to keep their servers cool. This is the equivalent water usage of 9,000 homes. Corrosive particulates and sediments in the Colorado River can damage electronic equipment, which is why most data centers in the region do not recycle the water that they use to cool their uh, servers. In a region that is drier than it has ever been in the last thousand years, how can such a waste of water resources be justified? For Arizona, the, the answer may lie in tax incentive, cheap energy, and a business-friendly legal environment. But Arizona is, is not exceptional. It, it's, a, it's a case study in a larger pattern. 20% of all the world's data centers rely on drought-stressed watersheds to cool their servers. And yet water stewardship is seldom addressed by data center companies. Sure, hyperscalers like Google with significant capital resources have pledged to reduce their water footprints by 2030. But such commitments, like decarbonization pledges, are reliant on corporate goodwill rather than any kind of enforceable regulation. But the cloud's veracity does not end with water or electricity. I have firsthand experience of the material waste that flows in and out of data centers as servers and other electronics are disposed of only to be replaced with newer ones. There is a revolving door of rare earth metals and minerals hard coded into the short lifespans of our electronic devices. The labor conditions in which they are exhumed from the earth should give pause to anyone who cares about human rights. The UN estimates that less than 20% of the electronic waste generated is recycled. Most of it ends up in computing graveyards like the one here, depicted here in Ghana, where toxic uh, residues from the digital debris leach into the watersheds, into the soils, and the bodies of people desperate to harvest precious metals like copper. Gartner reports that our demand for digital data storage will outpace our storage capacity by 2030. To resolve this asymmetry of supply and demand, a staggering number of data centers will have to be constructed over the next decade. By 2030, the cloud will likely devour over 20% of global energy resources. But these estimates are pretty conservative. On the horizon is the metaverse, 8K video, uh, artificial intelligence, cryptocurrency mining, autonomous vehicles, the list goes on. No one can say for certain if the cloud as we know it will be able to withstand this explosive growth. For the digital preservation community, the cloud is not only the engine of our civilization, <laughs> but a sprawling archive of life in the digital era, which leaves us with some really difficult questions. Must we preserve the cloud even as it burns us? Is the cloud beyond saving? Must the cloud come to an end? Whether we kill the cloud or remake it, the problem as I see it, stems from a deficit of imagination. We are conditioned by capitalism to think of our data as commodities rather than our heritage, to think of ourselves as consumers rather than stewards, to think of the cloud as a service rather than a community. 
For the cloud's unsustainability is, is rooted not only in its rising material impacts, but the mentality that keeps it afloat. Fantasies of infinite storage, uh, a culture that values instant gratification, constant availability. But how do we unravel this user as consumer attitude? How do we shed the market logics that condition us toward unsustainability? For those answers, I turn to Malka Older, a sociologist turned speculative fiction writer who sees her creative work as a form of speculative resistance. As Older frames it, speculative fiction is a laboratory for imagining new possibilities that challenge the hegemony of the present. When I say the word speculative fiction, I wouldn't blame you if what comes to mind is a blighted wasteland scorched by a nuclear war. Dystopias are instructive for what humanity's worst impulses might bring about, campy Hollywood adaptations notwithstanding. But I believe our moment requires something far bolder. Over the last decade, a movement of artists, writers, designers, and futurists are using speculative fiction to imagine a better world rather than a broken one. So named for its colorful aesthetic and its commitment to imagining renewable energy futures, solar punk is premised on the notion that imagining anything but a dystopia in our rapidly warming world is a radical political act. Solar punk stories are not avenues for escapism. They are blueprints for what could be, if we have the courage to bring them about. In what remains, I invite you to think like a solar punk and speculate about what might come after the cloud. Together, we'll imagine six scenarios premised on emerging technologies and their promise to remake the cloud and the society in which it flourishes. Scenario one, the sea is roiling. Something emerges from the deep. It peers up from the waves. Its metallic shell glints like the head of a maritime god. It is a submersible data center, a flotilla, a flotilla of servers cooled by the convective wash of the world's ocean, but also a city heated and powered by the residual warmth of computers. The data nautilus I describe may sound like something out of a Jules Verne's novel. But later this year, underwater data centers will go into deployment for the first time. Experimental data from Microsoft's Project Natick in the Orkney Islands suggests that undersea data centers might be just as reliable as their terrestrial counterparts, with the added benefit of having no, virtually no carbon or water footprint. In the next few years, these data submarines are slated to appear in Singapore, China, and the Western United States. Might the sea become the cloud's new home? Scenario two. In the near future, data centers might take up residence above the sky. Imagine a solar-powered armada of satellites with onboard server buses cooled by the vacuum of space. Such a future is being pursued by companies like Orbit's Edge, who hope to take the cloud into orbit. Outer space might seem like computing's final frontier, but servers have already made the leap into the stars. In 2021, the HPE Spaceborne Computer 2 was installed at the International Space Station to handle AI workloads. Due to zero gravity conditions, radiation, and the quirky physics of vacuum, uh, previous attempts to utilize solid state drives in space failed until now. Scenario three, imagine you are a historian from the distant future. The disk drives of the 21st century cloud are marred beyond recovery. Thankfully, there are data caverns you make your way into a subterranean vault, your headlamp catching the shimmer of something crystalline mounted on a pedestal. They look almost like stalagmites jutting up from the rock. 
You scan one of these quartzite sheets and uncover a wealth of information from the 21st century layered into its surface by a nanoscopic laser. The world described here might conjure images of Steven Spielberg's Minority Report, but it is far less distant than it might seem. Researchers at the University of Southampton have demonstrated that 5D memory crystals carved from abundant quartz minerals have a virtually limitless capacity for data storage. A 5D memory crystal has 10,000 times the storage capacity as a Blu-ray disc of an equivalent size. Scenario four. In the 30th century, an alien archeologist might stumble upon a Neo-Sumerian ziggurat looming above a desert. Inside, they gawk at shelf upon shelf of clay tablets that contain our entire digital heritage. The archeologist investigates how humanity's cloud became clay. They comb through records grafted into the tablets to retrace how our paradigm of data storage had to shift to accommodate this clay word course. They discover that the expectations of the masses had to be retrained. Humanity's culture of excess had to be tempered. No longer could they expect all of their data available instantaneously anywhere. Only data of the highest priority lived in hot storage in the cloud, while the rest slept in cold clay vaults. With this very scenario in mind, the Memory of Mankind project is grafting thousands of books onto ceramic tablets that will last for over 10,000 years. Rather than a ziggurat, their chosen time capsule will be housed in, a, in, a, in the stable climate of a salt mine. But this ambitious project is only one application for Cerebyte's ceramic-based data storage technology. They envision a cloud in which clay tablets and servers work together in seamless unison, a future where techs can transfer data in and out of cold storage as needed, significantly reducing their environmental footprints. Scenario five, let us now consider a future where data is grown. Instead of servers, living tissues might be the surfaces on which our data is grafted. Strings of ACTGs instead of ones and zeros. Like the threads of the kipu, life's most basic filaments might be twined with the code of our digital heritage. In such a world, you may be your own data steward, a gardener tending to crops that are memory. Media theorist Mel Hogan calls this coming era genomic media. The Grow Your Own Cloud Project, a marriage of engineering and artistic practice, explores the use of living plant tissues as storage devices. Moreover, the project invites us to consider how data storage might be democratized. How might concerns about data sovereignty shift if we are the ones who tend to our own data the way that we tend to our own plants at home or in our offices? This future is closer than you might think. In fact, there are people in this room who are working on this very thing. I'd love to hear what you have to say in the Q&A about that. Our final scenario is a bit stranger than the others. Since the Kipu, computing has relied on simple binaries to express information. Ons and offs, ones and zeros, streams of bits, as anyone who attended the handwriting binary code workshop can attest to. But in the coming decades, that all might radically change as we enter the strange realm of the quantum. The year is 2050. Meet coherence. A quantum supercomputer so powerful it must be cooled to near absolute zero Kelvin by a vat of liquid helium, harnessing the instability of matter itself. Quantum qubits are superpositional. Unlike our classical bits, they can appear as ones or zeros or both or somewhere in between. 
By exploiting quantum entanglement, theorists believe that optimization calculations that would take a classical computer thousands of years to solve might be performed by a quantum computer in a matter of minutes or hours. If the ecological challenges we face can be framed as an optimization problem, how might quantum computers help us to navigate the climate crisis? How might quantum computers help us to reshape our society and redistribute its wealth in a way that is, that is just? There are a lot of possibilities, a lot of questions. And with that, our journey through the ages is at an end. I hope the ride wasn't too bumpy. Um, the futures I have sketched for you this evening reveal what might be, um, but I challenge you to look past the dazzling technologies. I invite you to imagine the social worlds in which they might arise, worlds where each of us is a data gardener rather than a consumer of privately owned cloud services, worlds where some data are not always reachable because they rest in clay or crystal or strands of DNA, Worlds built on collective flourishing rather than abject suffering. Worlds where we don't have to make a choice between preserving our digital history and killing our planet. I want to conclude this evening by reflecting on a quotation by social theorist Ruha Benjamin, who says that the facts alone will not save us. Never before in our history have facts felt so feeble. For decades, our facts about climate change did little to reverse the course of our warming world. Because the facts were never enough. Perhaps fictions can do for us what facts have not. Today, I shared a great deal of facts about the cloud, but for every fact I shared, a story followed. Because technologies are not as concrete as we would like them to be. They are as social as they are material, as aspirational as they are practical. Technology is always reflective of the cultures that shape and wield it. And the beauty here is that culture is not static. We humans are dynamic and resilient and adaptive. We always change. And as such, design is never destiny. The only limits ahead of us are the limits of our collective imagination. Thank you. I'll stay here. <laughs> Wow, thank you so much, Steve. What a presentation. Um, well, this, this really, you really gave uh, the cloud a face, uh, which is not a happy face, I think, which is a daunting face, but you also provide us the scenarios for a way out. Um, just, well, it's the cloud, the, the floor is open for, for questions, because I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit speechless, so uh, <laughs> please ask your questions. <laughs> I, can you hear me? Yes. Thank yes. you so much for that presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. My name is Patricia Sleeman. I work in the High Commission for Refugees. And I have no question. <laughs> I just want to say uh, I was really moved by your talk. And I wonder if you've read the book that I hope everybody will read called Ministry of the Future by Kim Stanley Robinson, where he talks, a, it's about the, um, it's a dystopian view of climate change. And it, um, it's quite a long book. It's one of Barack Obama's favorite books of 2021. And the very last, it talks about a new way of data management, about owning our data, much like you were talking about, a new paradigm. And it 
leads us with the science and the evidence, but takes it to another level of fiction and thriller, so you read it. And the last chapter is utopian, much like your solar punk. And it's very uplifting in terms of new ways of looking at data and managing data. So it's reflective of like, stage three that you were talking about. And um, I just want to say that. And then I have a quote from the book. So what's the monetary value of human civilization? Trying to answer that question proves we are moral and practical idiots because it's not just about money. Thank you. That's all. Thanks. Thank you for that uh, really wonderful comment. Uh, I have read other books by Kim Stanley Robinson, but I have not read that one. I will add it to my, it's, it will be added to my TBR. <laughs> so thank you. Um, I mean, I think, I think that quote really does sum up nicely what, what I identify as, as, as the problem here is that, and I think over the last few days I've gotten to know this community and I can see that you're all so passionate about stewarding the future and you have this sense of responsibility. Um, and I'm really impressed with what you're doing to, to reduce the environmental footprint of your activities, things like digitization on demand, file compression, um, other configurations of infrastructure that are less costly. Uh, but, I, but I do think that this quote really does speak to the kind of wider culture wherein um, there is, there is, we are so conditioned to be consumers of cloud services to stream and binge and do all this, all the stuff that we do. Um, and it's, it's, it seems almost uh, unshakable, right? It seems, it seems like it's impossible to, to break that. But I think that, I think that it isn't. I think that we've changed radically before we can do it again. Uh, but I also think that crucially, it's the, the, the burden does not fall on us individually entirely, right? It falls on the people who are responsible for this. It falls on the cloud providers that continue to damage the planet, who make promises and fail to keep them. It, it falls on our politicians and elected officials to regulate this industry, which is largely unregulated. The EU is probably the place where it's most regulated. Um, so, so I think that there's a lot that we can do as consumers, so that we can demand um, environmental reforms from our uh, cloud service providers. Um, and then, but we can also, we also need to organize and, and be vocal. So, so yes, I think that we have to move beyond this mindset that all of the, the data that we're preserving can be reduced to uh, a monetary figure. I saw them, another question. Hi there. Hi, Stephen. That was great. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Um, one of the best keynotes I've, uh, I've, I've been to, honestly. Uh, but Thank you. What you were talking about always, I mean, it always reminds me as us being digital preservationists and uh, information managers, let's say, in, in various capacities. It always makes me think about our role of, uh, in appraising stuff. So right now we have a lot of redundant data. We, had, we have a lot of nonsensical data, things that are not really needed and there is very little effort to reduce the volume of that data. Even what we do individually, I mean, do we really need all these photographs that we keep in, on the cloud, you know? Do we need those 500 selfies where we've just kind of turned our, you know, our head by a, a millimeter? So what I'm thinking about in terms of the future is that a lot of what happens now in terms of cloud is based on demand. And I was wondering, from your perspective as an anthropologist and maybe, you know, from others here as uh, in, in, in our various capacities, whether we have a responsibility in this to think more closely or more strategically about how uh, we appraise what we keep. I think that's a really fantastic question. But as, as I have learned over the course of this conference uh, and attending some of the panels, what is, what is perhaps most fascinating about the work that you all do, the, the preservation work that you're doing, is, is this, this openness to a future that you cannot know, right? And, and so in that future, it's very difficult to, to know and anticipate what will be valuable to the future historians and the future uh, custodians of, of our heritage and what will not. Uh, we can make um, judgments about that 
and, and it, I've heard a lot about you know, different ways to prioritize what kind of data. I think one thing that I heard that was very concrete was the, like, as you said, levels of redundancy and backup, um, and how many copies and, and how many different file uh, format versions do we need uh, the same uh, material in. So I think that that's a, that's a really concrete way to think about it. And in my experiences in, in data centers, the entire system is so hyper-redundant to a point where it's hard to not think of it as waste. I mean, you have, you have, the data centers are, there is a diesel generator running so that if a hurricane knocks out the power grid, there's still power. You have multiple air conditioners that are just idling just in case one of the air conditioners fail or it gets too hot. You have so many levels of redundancy, servers, servers themselves. Uh, there was a study done by an IT consultant by the name of Jonathan Kumi in California, and he found that over 40% of servers in some enterprise data centers are doing nothing. They're zombie servers, they're just there in case they need to be used. And so yes, the, the question of redundancy is a really important one um, because the cloud service providers, they, have, they, they guarantee us this instantaneous gratification, this constancy, and they're willing to, to uh, bring it about at whatever cost. And so that is, that is where I think we as consumers and publics need to be more ver verbal about the kinds of things that we're willing to tolerate, the kinds of practices that are in line with an ethos that will get us through the next decade. Um, as, as the climate emergency that we're in, is, it requires extreme and radical measures. So, so yes, I think, I think that looking more closely at what, what is a necessary level of redundancy is, is important as we go forward. Before I come to you, uh, Lotta, I, I first take an online question. Sure. Uh, there is uh, one question. Your scenarios were amazing. Do you have a favorite uh, story to tell or a story you think is likely? That, that is I, a really... Maybe to add in, in very short term. Yeah, um, I think that is a really fantastic uh, qu uh, question for me because it's one that I debated about as I was shaping this talk and thinking about the future of data storage beyond uh, today. Um, I think that for me, you know, there, there's different levels of like, a lot of factors to weigh as to which future is better. I think that the future that is better is a heterogeneous one, right? So right now, we are server-based. <laughs> um, so any, a world where we are server-based and other things would be better. It doesn't have to be one of those scenarios in particular, but it, it, we need, we need to have other options. I also think that the paradigm shift of having cold versus hot storage is really an important transitional step because that requires the least amount of disruption of our existing infrastructure. So if we can explore the technologies that allow for something that resembles a cold storage where, wherein the energy used to keep the data stored in that medium, whether it's clay or crystal or whatever the um, other possibilities, DNA are, um, that is, that is probably the best transitional step that I can imagine because I, 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 based on what I've seen, the levels of, of entrenchment of, of cloud infrastructure are so vast, they're, they're, they're so deep, it's very hard to see everybody sort of packing up and leaving. So we need something that can transition them away. Oh, some, oh, someone up there first. Yes, Hi. you were first. <laughs> is, it, is it on? Yeah. Uh, Lot yeah. Weisman, uh, National Archives of the Netherlands. We talked okay. yesterday. Um, I was wondering, you were showing the different scenarios, and I was very interested by the first one, the storage underwater, and I saw it in the news as well. Um, but the second, after I think, yeah, it's great, and then I think about the poor fish, yes. and them having the, the bubbles beneath them um, just being like, uh, rage, migraines, the humming. Um, what are your thoughts on things that might seem great but aren't? Um, and more specifically, um, them being sold to us and just seeming great but they really are not. Could you elaborate on that? Thank you, uh, excellent question. So for all five utopic happy scenarios that I sketched, those same technologies could bring about very dystopian realities as well, perhaps. So it, it is, I think for, for today, it was important to see a positive,
future or a future where we can get out of this. But it is also very important to be aware because the fact that, that, that uh, submarine data centers could bring about some kind of dystopian scenario wherein they subtly shift oceanic currents or something, um, it, we should be thinking about that. Um, but, it also, but we also have to think about the culture and how the culture in our society is going to be structured around it. Because we can't give the technology too much agency. We have a lot of agency as well. And as we saw with the internet and how it evolved, it was not just this logical progression of technology improving itself. It was shaped based on the, our, the pattern of the way that we used it and the demands that we as a society uh, placed upon it and as consumers. And so I think it's, it's really crucial to not underestimate our own influence in shaping how the technology will be enfolded into our society. Um, but as far as underwater data centers could go, um, those preliminary studies indicate that there are no ecological concerns. I do have my own concerns about the, the uh, how, how shall I say this? The, um, I have concerns that perhaps there are some things that were overlooked. You know, the underwater ecosystems are incredibly complex. Perhaps there's something they missed or that they're not anticipating. My experience with the noise pollution, for instance, um, it, maybe the noise will impact ecosystems in a way that's really catastrophic. Um, but it's, it's hard to say. Is, is it better than putting them um, in, in the desert of Arizona and, and continuing to you know, rapidly dry the land? I think, yeah, but, but yeah. So, so, so then it, it really just comes down to how we incorporate it into our society and how we as a culture and society um, adopt these technologies, because we do have a lot of agency. Hi, thank you. Uh, an amazing and thought-provoking um, keynote. Um, I, wonder, I wonder how you feel, you talked a moment ago about agency. Um, I wonder how you feel if about a scenario where individuals have more explicit agency in their information so that in, at, at the moment we live in a consumer world where the big leviathans um, make use of our data allegedly for our benefit um, but there's a, there's, a, there's a deal with the devil that goes on when we use social media. Um, we have a free good but of course it isn't free. Um, if we imagine a scenario where, say, just in a med, I, I'll think about medical information. Imagine instead of when I go to a hospital in the UK, they have to find their data about me by looking it up on a server. They can somehow read something in me about my data that I carry with me with one of these technologies that you've discussed. How does that change the how does that change the relationship between the cloud the cloud and me does that I, I don't know if I've made that articulate or not but thank you I think that's a that's a really uh, fascinating question thank you and it, it does it, it actually reminds me of the amazing keynote that we heard that Tamar delivered about community stewardship of information right a different scale right so so the community archives that were discussed were led by people and they were on a small scale and um, you know, the, the sovereignty of the data was, was not an issue in the sense that like, it was actually it was owned and maintained by the people that it belonged to. And I think that that's, there's, there's certainly some uh, advantages to that. There's, there, like, as you said, we, there's, we, we make a bit of a Faustian <laughs> bargain when we upload things to social media because now Twitter or any of these social media companies have a, have a bit of ourselves and our lives as their proprietary data on their servers. And it's, supposedly it's our data, but it's also their data, right? And so, and so these technologies do have the potential to reconfigure those dynamics. And I think it's really crucial for us to think about that because in addition to environmental sustainability, it is very hard to uh, anticipate the future of, of, of what these corporations and companies will do with our data. 
maybe, just, just as you have all been saying, there are future uses for, for the kind of stuff that you're preserving digitally that you can't yet anticipate. And perhaps in the future, these corporations can look at our health data and do, do very um, terrible things. We, we don't know. And so I think it's really crucial that we get to an environment that's more heterogeneous, where there are a world of clouds rather than a single cloud, if that makes sense. I was just informed that we cannot continue until 8 o'clock tonight. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, we, we would like to. Um, so we, we have to do one uh, final question. Uh, and I take off my glasses now, to just not seeing you and not seeing all hands raising. Uh, but there was a question. Oh, I have the mic. Can uh, I? The can you all okay. hear sorry. me? <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi, um, Amber Cushing, uh, School of Information Communication Studies, University College Dublin. Um, you may not be aware of the situation going on in Ireland right now. Um, a lot of talk about data centers. We've been told to prepare for rolling blackouts because they're sucking our energy grid dry. My new colleague, uh, Patrick Brody, is studying this issue in the Irish context. Uh, we hired him specifically because he had interest in that. But my question is, and after talking with him and hearing your talk, is when we talk about advocacy and digital preservation, when I teach students, a lot of that rhetoric is we have to tell people saving stuff is important and saving digital stuff is important. But what I'm seeing is that, at least in Ireland, is a lot of distancing away from data centers. There's a lot of politicians saying, no, 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 we must stop them and, you know, they're bad and they're killing us and all of these things. So there is a little bit more of the, that kind of discussion of the evil data center in pop, pop culture in Ireland, right? So my question is, I wonder if uh, you know, in digital preservation, do we need to think about actually talking about data centers more in digital preservation and how we do advocacy? And do we, do we need to think about distancing ourselves from the evil data center? And ev if, we, if we think that's a good idea, maybe we do, maybe we don't, how would we do that? And what do you think? Great question. Uh and uh, yes, I am, I am actually familiar with uh, Patrick Brody's work and, and also the, the very challenging situation in Ireland right now where data centers are consuming so much electricity that the grid is, is strained beyond, um, beyond any kind of sustainable uh, level. Um, and, and we're seeing that in other places too, that there are now uh, moratoriums on further construction of data centers in places like Singapore, for instance. Um, but, but yes, I do think that it is important to, I mean, there's a trade-off, right? Because I've, I've heard about, there was a really wonderful talk about how if we can, if we move our uh, digital preservation archives into the cloud, we will save energy because we'll, we'll um, take advantage of the more efficient cooling and software and co computational workload distribution and, and, and other things. But then on the, on the flip side of that, we've seen that how the cloud is also, that carbon is not the only concern, right? Carbon, there's water, there's noise. There's this waste. Um, so I, I think that maybe it, it seems almost impossible to do what you do without data centers of some kind, right? So maybe it's about making statements about your, uh, about your values and about the kinds of uh, sustainability projects that you, that you want to, to look at in terms of uh, data center and data storage. Uh, but also maybe it's about making informed choices about which cloud providers to to um, send your data to and to signal that to others. Because one thing that I have found is that with these companies, what's in their, they, it is inter, in their interest to think about sustainability when it reduces their total cost of operation or when it um, offers a, a business opportunity in the sense of if, if all the digital, if the DPC is endorsing a, a select few cloud providers or data centers that are really have proven their commitment to, to sustainability justice, then, you know, then that, that puts pressure on others to do the same, to attract more. But that, those, are, those are my early thoughts on that. I, I will continue to think about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, thank you very much, uh, Stephen, for this uh, wonderful presentation. And, Please give Stephen another round of applause. Thank you.